Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time, is it not? Amen. Amen. The sun is shining, the S-U-N is shining on the outside, but the S-O-N is shining on the inside. Amen. We're going to stand and do our morning hymn. Our morning hymn is hymn 86. Hymn 86, everyone standing. If you have two feet, stand. If you have two feet, stand. Hymn 86. Hymn 86. If you have two feet, try to stand. Those of you who are at home, you can stand too. <laughs> Impossible. Hymn 86, how great thou art. Let's sing. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands did frame, I see the stars, I hear Sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Second stanza. Sounds good to me. Lift your voices. That's it. Let's ring it out. Let's sing my soul, my Savior God. God to thee. 
Because we know God is great. He has all power. All power in this. Let's say amen as the choir is coming. Long with Sister Tamisha Mason. All power. Let's say amen again.
today. Aren't you thankful that God has all power? There is no other power greater than our God's power. I want to thank the choir for sharing that testimony with us today that we serve a God that has all power. He, he was in the grave, but he got up. Hallelujah. We don't have to just wait to Easter to talk about that. He met the disciples on the sloping slats of Mount Olivet. And he said, I got all power in my hands. I, I imagine Peter said, Lord, give me some of that power. And Jesus said, no, Peter, you don't know what to do with this power. You'd, you'd go take all the fish out the sea if you had all power. Uh, Thomas, uh, uh, Thomas probably said, Lord, give me your power. He said, Thomas, you don't know. You, you, you'd probably uh, doubt the whole world. You wouldn't, you wouldn't understand what to do with this power. And James and John said, let us have all the power. You'd kill all the Sadducees and all the Samaritans. But Jesus says, I go and I have all power. You go back up into the upper room and, and you wait there for a little while. Is anybody listening to me? And you pray. And if, when you keep praying and get on one accord, I'm going to give you the power. God has the power, but he wants to give it to us. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got power from God. You got power from God. I, I don't know how much money you have. I don't know how much uh, 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 clout you have, but you have power from God. He says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Choir, thank you for reminding us that we have a powerful God. We have a powerful God. Let's talk to him today. Would you bow your heads as we seek God in prayer? Father, which art in heaven, thank you so much for your love for us. We cannot do anything without you. And today we come talk to a God that is all-powerful, omnipotent. <laughs> a God that says, if I was hungry, I would not ask you because I own the cattle on a thousand hills. A God that says, what can separate us from the love of God? Uh, nothing can separate us. A God that says all things work together for good for them that love God. A God that said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Now, Lord, help us to honor you by loving obedience to all your commands. Bless those that are watching today on one of the platforms and those that are here this morning. Lord, just draw us all closer to you. Help us to know that the same power that you have, you're willing to infuse our lives that we will be your witnesses. And whatever sickness that we have, you're willing to heal our lives that we may be restored. Whatever financial issues that we have, you're willing to bless our lives that we will have more than enough so that we can share with others. Oh God, whatever we're going through, help us to claim the power of God. All power is in your hands. And oh God, help us to experience that power in the life, in our own lives. Lord, we pray for those that are going through bereavement today. Those that are hurting because of loved ones that have gone to sleep. Lord, we pray for those that have loved ones that are out of the ark of safety. They're living a life that's far from the Father's house in a strange land. They, they're prodigal living. Oh God, call them back to you. Let them realize that this is nothing that is joyful in, in this way. In fact, the way of the sinner is a hard way. Oh God, take them to a pig pen if you have to, but bring them back home at your own time, Lord. We will give you the praise and the honor for it because we know your children are your heritage. Oh, God, we pray that you'll be with those that are incarcerated and those that are, that are just hopeless today. We pray that you'll let them know that you can, you can give power in their lives. Somebody today listening or, or even in this room wants to make a decision to follow Jesus, let them choose even today to hook up with your power. Your power is, is stronger than Memphis's power, stronger than United States power, you have universal power. You have cosmic power. Oh, God, as we accept that, accept that power in our lives, shine out in our lives that we may turn to you as naturally as the flower turns to the sun. Be with us and give us your grace today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. Welcome to church, everybody. I'm going to let our clerk come forward and welcome us officially. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Let us lean on Jesus every day of our lives, for he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be honored, and he is worthy to be leaned on. I'd like to offer you a special welcome to our church. Whether you are here in body and spirit or here on one of our virtual platforms, please know that you are truly welcome. Those guests who are present here, please let us give you a special welcome. Will you please stand? You can stand again if you want to. He was here the other week. Let's give him a special welcome. Thank you for coming again, and you are welcome again. Thank you for coming here, and please come again. We are located, for those who are not here, we are located at 685 East Mallory. And our pastor is Pastor Alex Horton. I'd like to make a sad announcement first, and then I have another one. Our former pastor, Pastor J.M. Doggett, passed this week, and he had a special meaning to my husband and me. He baptized my husband in 1969, and a little while later, he married the two of us, and it was at the Alsey Seventh-day Adventist Church over on Alsey Road. And so, We'll hear more about his passing later on as far as the arrangements and all of that. Now, my other announcement comes from our inReach leader, Sister Mariah Brown. Please, she wants us to celebrate Mother's Day. Please send in one or two photos of your mom or grandmother, aunt, sister, cousin, or friend. Words to, and then some words to describe your mom or whoever you are honoring. And she also wants three volunteers to speak 10 minutes on motherhood. The deadline is May 7th. Please send everything to Mariah Brown. Her email address is mariahbrown92 at gmail.com. You want me to say it one more time? <laughs> mariahbrown92 at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to uh, send her a text I call her. Her number is 901-337-0577. I didn't see anybody writing down, so I'm going to tell you one more time. It's 901-337-0577. Thank you for coming here today, and please come again. Those who are on seeing us virtually or those who are here present, thank you so much. Amen, amen, amen. 
This by way of announcement, if you didn't know it, there is a special ministry that we have every week. It's called prayer meeting. Hallelujah. Prayer meeting is some place where we can get together and we can pray. Does anybody need prayer? I know I need prayer often. And so prayer meeting is a time that we can pray. And you know, we have prayer meeting on Zoom. So you can go on prayer meeting. And like many of you do, you don't show your face. I, I, I say that you're, you're in the balcony, okay? You don't, we don't see your face. And so I know that you're just maybe in your pajamas or maybe you're, 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 you're uh, cooking or eating or something. But I know that you're praying anyway. Hallelujah. And I, I hope that you continue to go to prayer. Our prayer meeting is being uh, conducted by our deaconess and our deacons for the month of May. And we've been having a very good time. I want to thank each deaconess and deacon that has been doing prayer meeting. Um, and I hope that you enjoy fellowshipping with us at prayer meeting. There's something else that we have in our church which I'm tremendously excited about. And that is a Memphis Adventist Academy. Memphis Adventist Academy is an opportunity for your children to learn about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that it's something that you start thinking about. If you have some young people that would like to go to Memphis Adventist Academy, uh, check them out online. See if you like it. Go by and visit them, okay? And I believe that you'll really enjoy um, the activities, the academics, and the spirituality that's there at Memphis Adventist Academy. Our children are the most important important people, are the greatest asset in our lives. I also want to tell you that for evangelism this year, the Lord has led me to have a program for children. Come on and say amen. We have a program for children. And so during, during this summer, from starting in June and July, uh, I think it's July 28th, June, June to July 28th, uh, we're going to have a program right in our church from 11 to 4 o'clock where the children, instead of them having a problems in their homes or thinking that someone may shoot them or may be shot by, by somebody in the neighborhood, they can come to a safe place. Isn't that awesome? They can come to a safe place. I, I can't take all the guns out of Memphis, but maybe we can get a safe place for them to be. And... We can share the gospel with these young people. Isn't that a good news? That's what we want to do. I know that many of us are busy, but if you have some time doing uh, Monday through Friday, uh, 11 to 4, we'll have a meal for them. In fact, we'll have two meals for them, and we have a place where they can come. So we're, we're trying to touch the lives of the people in the community on a regular basis. That's awesome, isn't it? I think that is a fantastic thing that we can do. So I'm encouraging you, if you have some time that you can give for us, we'd love for you to do that. We're just going to have some fun. If anybody knows Pastor Horton, he loves to party. He loves to have fun. And we're going to have fun with those kids. And we're going to live in front of them so that they can see Jesus Christ in us. I hope that you can participate in it as well. So I'll be telling you some more about that, but that's going to start in June. And we know... God is going to bless. I want you to keep in prayer. Sister Houston, she lost uh, her nephew. Uh, she's having a memorial service on tomorrow at 1 o'clock. So keep her in your prayers. Today, I've invited a friend of mine to be our speaker as well. We had a great time last Sabbath with uh, Noah Washington. Noah Washington, is, uh, he's just he's got so much energy, right? We had a lot of fun with him on, on our youth day. Today we have our conference president, Elder Benjamin Jones, to be our speaker for this Sabbath. Elder Jones is not new here. He actually pastored in Memphis a few years ago, and uh, this time he's coming as our conference president. He passed, he's the president of the South Central Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, he's been pastoring for is it over 50, 50, 52 years Come on and say amen. Come on and say amen. That, that's a pretty good record. Uh, and I'm thankful that he's, he's a man that loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I enjoy his friendship. We were able to just sit down this week and talk a little bit and get to know each other even better. So after our choir sings our special number, 
Then the next voice that you'll hear is the man of God speaking his holy word. Um, be, be ready to listen to the word and follow what it says, and God's Holy Spirit will guide you. Thank you, Elder Jones, for being here today, and we'll be waiting for God's word. Song says, There is a place where I want to be. How many you know that this is not your this is not your final home? <clears throat> the truth is that you, you're going somewhere. <laughs> you, you, you're gonna end up somewhere. <laughs> So this song says a place, there's a place, that's where I want to be. Let's say man is Evangelist Audra Owens is <laughs> coming along with the choir. Say man as the choir comes with the place.
Aren't you glad to be in the house of God today? Waiting for the Lord to come so there'll be no more crying and no more dying and no more sadness and no more trouble. Thank you, Lord. Let's give the choir a praise today. Thank you for your ministry to my heart. Now, I came to church to praise the Lord today because God's been good to me. I don't know how he's been good to you or not. But I look in your faces and I see that you've been through some stuff. <laughs> so turn to the person there and just say, it's going to be all right. God's got this. God's got you. The Lord's going to bless anyhow. Uh, I bring you greetings from the South Central office. Dr. Griffin and Sister Creighton and our officers. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness uh, here at Longview. The last time I was here, I was here on baptismal Sabbath behind our crusade. And I'm glad to see some of the family that was added that day here. Let's give them a hand. I promised them that when they came to Longview, they came to one of the best churches in town and that we would love them and take care of them and watch over them. So I hope you didn't make me a liar. <laughs> I'm hoping you they feel that they're a part of a wonderful spiritual family. I want to thank my friend Elder Horton and his lovely wife for hosting me while I've been here. I want to also say to you, I thank you for being one of the strong supporters in this town of Christian education. Oh, y'all, I'm going to try it again. A church that can't save its children can't save the world. We've lost one generation. I'm determined we won't lose any more. And the, one of the best evangelistic engines we have is Christian education. Right now, this church and the other congregations are working together to do something in this area and in the union that has not been done anyplace else. That's right. The Kentucky 10 Conference and the South Central Conference are bringing, back, bringing together two congregations and two constituencies to reimagine what church school could be. Right. I don't want to just be another school in the city. I don't want to just manage Christians and children. I want us to rebuild and reimagine what we can be that Memphis Adventist Academy will be the premier private school in Memphis, Tennessee. Amen. I need your prayers. I need your children. I need your support. I need your money. Right. If we can build trust among us and faithfulness, we're going to do something that will set the standard for every other system in the Southern Union. I've got people from all over the country watching to see if it can happen in Memphis. And if it can happen in Memphis, it can happen anywhere. This, this Sunday, tomorrow, the task force that has come together to work on this will move again. So pray for us. This is no easy thing, building trust and challenges when we have not had trust is a God thing. And when this thing comes down, I want to say, God did it. And we want to praise the Lord for what he has done. This morning, I want to pray and then get right into the word if that's okay with you. Let's pray. Loving Lord, I'm so thankful that you blessed us to be in the house of God once again. I do ask, Lord, that you will place your spirit in a such a way that I can put into words what you place on my heart. And that some of those who've come today may hear from this poor preacher a word from the Lord that was in due season. We thank you in Jesus' name. Let his people say, amen. amen. If you have your Bible with you, turn with me to the book of Revelation. And I want to look at Revelation 3, beginning at the 14th verse. The book of Revelation verse 3 chapter 3 verse 14 and notice what the lord himself says and then the angel of the church for the lay of the scenes right these things says the amen the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of god 
I know your works. That you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, you say, I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white garments, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. For he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. For those of us who are not familiar with the book of Revelation, John, the writer of Revelation, was the last of the 12 apostles. All the other 11 were dead. John ends up now the pastor of Ephesus Church. And when Caesar now tries to make the Christians worship Caesar, they tell John, you can, work, you can worship your Jesus, but you have to also worship Caesar. And John says, I will worship nobody but Jesus. John was 97 years old. You know, you ever been in a place where you, you've done something so long you can't change? <laughs> so John says, I've been on this way a long time. I, I've seen some things and experienced some things. And I was with you. In fact, John was the youngest of the 12. And so he says, do what you want to do. I, I won't serve anyone but Jesus. So they took this old man and put him in a vat of boiling oil. He should have died. But you know, when God takes care of you, <laughs> God made the boiling oil a, a bubble bath. <laughs> and when they couldn't make him turn around, when they couldn't kill him with oil, they said, this is, he's too dangerous to leave here. So they took him out of the church and put him on the Isle of Patmos, a, 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 just a stranded 50 miles out into the Aegean Sea, and they thought he would die. It was on a Sabbath morning. John was worried about what was going to happen to church. He says, I'm the last one. I'm the only one. And now what is going to happen when I die out here? And on that Sabbath morning, Jesus shows up. He shows up dressed like a high priest. His hair was full of light. His eyes were like fire. His feet were like brimstone. And when John saw this glowing, powerful Jesus, John went, whoa, and passed out. Lord said, John, wake up, boy. Don't be afraid. It's me. And when John looked and saw him, he saw Jesus standing in the midst of the lampsticks. The lamp stands would be in the sanctuary. And he saw him adjusting the candles. He had stars in one hand. And John says his words were like a double-edged sword. And, and now he says, John, I need you to get your notebook out. Because I'm about to reveal to you what's going to happen to the church. You asked what was going to happen to the church. Let me tell you what's going to happen to the church. And I want to give you the good news first. Though the church will go through hell and back, it will be victorious. Why? It's not man's church. It's not Richard Jones's church. It's not a Horton church. It's not a Longview church. It's the church of God. And the church of God will stand when everything else is gone. 
So John says, I got my notebook, and now he begins to write. The first thing that the Lord told him to write, there were seven churches throughout Asia Minor. He says, I want to write a special note to each of the churches because I want you to encourage them. I will point out their weaknesses, and I will point out their, what they need to do to be all they can be. But also in that writing, Jesus unfolds before John the whole stages of the church, how the church will move from the Christ all the way to just before he came so we can know in advance, oh, I like that kind of stuff, the Lord tells you in advance what's going to happen so when it comes, you're not all shaken up. Oh, y'all y'all not Y'all not lying today. You know, we see troubles, and we, we see shootings, and we see evil, and we say, oh, what's going to happen now? Mm. Let me tell you, God is not at any emergency committee meeting tonight. That's right. He's not saying, oh, Jesus, have you, heard, have you, have you checked CNN down in Memphis? Mm. The Holy Spirit is not saying what we need to have as special committee. But God who sees the end from the beginning knows all that's happening up front. Right. You have to remember, the devil is already lost. That's right. He's a beaten foe. That's right. He talks bad. <laughs> he, he, he talks trash, but the Bible says he's a lion that has a chain on him. Yeah. Well, I don't have time to preach today, but I, I remember when I was a kid, Donna, I had a neighbor's dog. That dog would growl, and every time I'd walk by him, he'd look like if I could get out of this fence, if I could just get over the sidewalk, if I could just jump that tree, I'd have you for breakfast. And I was, I'd be scared because I had to go to school past him every day. And every day, rah, 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 rah. and I would pray, oh Lord, don't let this dog bite me and kill me. And I, I could see my life passing before me. I, 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 I'm going to die one day. But then I recognized the dog had a chain on him. There was a stake in the ground. It was a long chain. He had lots of room, but he couldn't get to me because the chain wouldn't let him. When I recognized, ha ha, that dog is chained. I just bark back, go ahead, bark, dog. <laughs> rah, 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 I'd bark back, you know. I, I would talk smack, you know. I, I would say, you know, I might have dog burgers from you. I was no longer afraid because he was chained. Oh, don't let the devil mess with you. Don't be afraid of what's going on. The devil that you and I are seeing is a chain devil. He's got, he has his eviction notice already. God's done told him you're done, and I'm going to come back and get rid of you. So don't keep your eyes on what he's doing. Keep your eyes on what God has said. So now, John sees the church. In this early stage, it was a church of power, the Holy Spirit. They were being baptized by the thousands, and John, Jesus affirmed them. But he noticed even in the early church, they got slowly moving away. He says, your problem is you're busy, but you don't love like you used to love. Church moved from being a church of power and they began to lose that kind of love. Then persecution came and they thought that would destroy the church. The devil tried to wipe the church out literally. Uh -huh. But for everybody who died in persecution and were destroyed by the Caesars, 10 more came. Right. Somehow, bad times make good Christians. That's right. Oh, y'all y'all don't understand that. I, I, can, I, can, I, can I be real? How many of you don't really start praying until trouble comes? You know, your money is doing fine, your family's fine, your grandchildren are doing fine, you enjoy your vacation, and you, you can't make it to prayer meeting right now because you're busy. But when somebody dies, or your job is wrong, or somebody, the doctor tells you that you've got a bad cancer coming, oh, pastor, pray for me. Who's on the, on the Zoom? Remember my family, too. You, you, you get real serious when trouble comes. And so when the church was about to be destroyed, 
Jesus told them, hold on, because I who have died and resurrected and come back, I'm in charge of the key, death and key, so don't worry about it. I got you. Then the church moved to compromise. They thought they could win the world by taking some of the world's doctrines and the church's doctrine and moves up. See, God never planned for the church to mirror the world. God planned for the world to mirror the church. You got the light. You got the truth. You got God. What the world is looking for, God has already given to his people. And then the dark ages came and compromise came. And then the church that was supposed to be reflecting God became the church that was persecuting the Christians. Then when the Protestant movement began, the church began to move back. For 1,200 years, the church didn't have the Bible to read. And they were following the traditions of men. Can I I give you a a suggestion? Find Jesus for yourself. This is a great pastor. I love him, but he can't save you. This is a great church. I've been in and out of this church for 40 years. Some of the best people in the planet are in Longview, but they can't save you. Know the word of God for yourself. Feed your mind and study the word. And and besides studying the word, you need to experience the word. Or turn to the person next to you and say, I need to experience the word. Oh, y'all weak. I'm going to try to, this crowd up here. Say to the man, I'm going to experience the word. What am I talking about? I'm talking about when you read the Bible and read the word, it's an intellectual thing. God says he'll come through. I believe it. But you won't know he comes through until he comes through for you. God says he'll provide. Preacher told you to quit your job. But you're working on Sabbath, and you need two or three jobs. Mm-hmm. You got half a dozen family members to take care of. But you said, I'm going to do what God says and see if God can make up the difference. Right. And when God does make up the difference, when God does respond, when God does what he says, then the word of God for you is not just a theory. It's a word that you have lived and can say, from, by my experience, the God I serve is able. And every one of you must have that personal experience if you're going to survive as we're coming to the end of time. But here in our text, John now hears Jesus come to the last church and the last age. This is the state of the church in the end time. Notice here, and to the angel of the church Laodicea. The word Laodicea here means judged and acquitted. After this church experience, Christ comes. The early church struggled because of the compromise of doctrines and truth. But the last church doesn't have that problem. The last church now has a clear vision of the word of God. They have now recaptured the truth of the early age. They now understand what Jesus was preaching. They have their whole gospel again. They have flourished and are strong. But you can be strong on the outside. God does not judge you based just on your behavior. In fact, I want to say God doesn't judge you on your behavior at all. Oh, can I preach a moment? You and I are not saved by doing. We're saved by grace. Oh, I'm going to try it again. When I was a child, they had a whole list of stuff I couldn't do. I I didn't join the church, okay? I got to quit chasing girls. No more smoking, no more drinking. Can't be at the nightclub. Can't go to the football game on Friday night. Can't go party with my friends. Can't, can't. And I, I remember my friends asked me, Pastor, you a Christian? Oh, yes. Uh, what do you do? I said, I can't do that. Well, how about this? I can't do that. Either. 
I walked by the doctor, and when I got through all the cancer, I said, oh, I don't think I want to be a Christian because your life seems boring. And I used to be all sad. Lord, I joined church and I found Jesus. I can't do nothing. I'm so sad. And I recognized that living for Jesus is not a bunch of don'ts. What I recognized, the things that God told me to back off of, it's because he wanted me to live a better life. Right. I, I, when I was out in the streets with my friends, I was busy and unhappy. I was trying to be what everybody else wanted me to be. I know y'all don't have that problem. You know, I, you know, I, I wanted to be accepted. So when everybody was cool, I learned how to be cool. I had a cool walk. Oh, I, used to, uh, I used to have a cool haircut. I used to have uh, uh, cool clothes. I, I, when, when they wanted smart people, I'd carry books. I'd wear glasses and didn't need them because I wanted to look intelligent. And every time I tried to be what somebody else said I should be so I could be accepted, they would change the rules. Nobody could ever accept me for what I was. They always wanted me to be somebody else. And I was changing over and over again that I didn't know who I was. Until Jesus said to me one day, Ben, I'll take you just like you are. You don't have to be better. You don't have to be good. You don't have to be nice. I'll take you all messed up like you are. I will love you with maximum love just like you are. When I recognized that God loved me, God died for me. God wants me all messed up. It brought me to a level of peace that I had never known before. Amen. A sense of wholeness, a sense of purpose. I was going to be somebody. I was going to go someplace because the God who created me, who knew everything about me, was fighting for me, and his love of me made me somebody. Amen. Well, I got an education, but that didn't make me somebody. I, I got a beautiful wife, but that didn't make me somebody. I drive a nice car, but that didn't make me somebody. What made me somebody is Jesus loved me. God adopted me. I am a child of the king. Here, Jesus looks at them and says, I got a problem with you. My problem is I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were cold or hot. Oh, the, oh, this caught me. Lord, what's the problem with the church? Well, then the problem is they're complacent. They're not on fire like they should be. They know enough Bible they can't afford to be cold. They're scared of hell, but they're not fixed for heaven. They got one foot in Memphis and one foot in heaven, and they're kind of be in both places at the same time. They're for Jesus when it's convenient, but when it's not convenient, you can't find them. They have a knowledge greater than any other people, and they think because they have knowledge, they're okay. Oh, I like that. You've heard people say, you know, we have the truth. And sometimes, I know y'all don't do that. I know y'all, 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 y'all real Christians here, but sometimes people brag on that. They, they look down, all those poor Baptist people, Pentecostal kind of people, oh, and those, those sad Catholic people, you know, but you know, we have the truth. The question is, do you not, do you have the truth? The truth, the question is, do the truth have you? Right. Remember, the truth is not a doctrine. The truth is a person. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When Christ found you, he found you all messed up. And when you heard about his grace, you were so grateful that he forgave you. And cleared. you remember the fire in your soul when you first recognized Jesus saves me? You didn't know a lot of Bible, but you were just bubbling. Every time the church showed up, here you go. <laughs> the preacher would preach, you take notes, you go back and tell your people, 
you know, the Saturday is the right day. Well, where is it in the Bible? I don't know where it's in the Bible yet. I'll get, I'll get my pastor on you, but I, I discovered. And then people were so sad, sorry to have you come around because as soon as you get there, here you go talking about Jesus again. They try to calm you down, calm you down. You don't have to be all that excited. You know, the word will come and you jump up in church. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Then somebody comes with a handkerchief. <laughs> He's, he'll be all right. <laughs> you were just excited because of what God had done. But after a while, you lose something. After a while, life gets to you. After a while, sickness and trouble and divorce and issues beat on your spirituality and you still go through the routine of spirituality, but there's something missing here in Laodicea. They felt that they didn't need anything else. They had the health message. They had the doctrines. They had the church. They had everything necessary. And because of what they had here and how they, they positioned themselves, they thought that was okay. I'm more afraid of being successful and prosperous than being poor. Because when we do better, we don't feel we need God as much. Oh, y'all know it, me. <laughs> when your bank account is smooth and you don't have to pray about what you need to do, you just have to do it because you got the money for it. You, you, don't, you don't thank the Lord as much. And after a while, when you accumulate some kind of stability, you want to see that I got this way because of my hard work. This is my house. I work for it. I make those paintings. That's my car. That's my family. That's my, my, my. You forget, if the Lord didn't wake you up and keep it in your right mind, you couldn't hold that job. All y'all know how to Let you get a stroke tomorrow. Let, let something happen to you tomorrow. And your whole world changes in a minute. Jesus says, you're neither hot nor cold. If you were cold, I could come at you and revive you. If you're hot, I could use you to finish the work. But in your mindset of complacency, in your sense that everything's all right, you know, I remember asking somebody, uh, are there any sins that you're trying to get over? And they had to think hard. Well, Pastor, as I think about it, there are one or two things that I need to get over. And I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to bust the bubble, Sister Gordon. I, I knew 25 things. <laughs> but in their mind, because they didn't do all these bad things anymore, they were okay. The Bible talks about not only the sins of commission, the stuff you should not be doing, the Bible talks about the sins of omission, the things you ought to be doing. When Jesus saved you, he saved you for a purpose. When Jesus blessed you, he blessed you that he might bless others. I want to ask you, who in this family, who in this church, who in your family, who in this community's life is better because you've got Jesus? Wow. Wow. All kind of mess with you again? I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to look anybody in the eye. I want to say to my elders, you've been anchor men and women in this church for 25 years. Have you baptized two people, ten people, five people? Don't look at me. Anybody can read the scripture. Anybody can take the offering. But it takes men and women who have been in contact to change other people's lives. What the church needs is the Holy, kind of, Holy Spirit kind of leadership where people see something in you so attractive, so powerful, so consistent that they're asking you, what must I do to be saved? You know, I, I'm, I'm running out of time. i got about 10 more minutes before I get to what I want to say, and i got to say it quickly. I keep thinking of Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi, beaten, and you hear them singing. Holy Ghost comes, angels come, break open the doors. The jailer brings out his knife to cut his throat. He said, don't cut your throat, boy. We didn't go to a place. We're here. What you doing here? 
Well, you really, we came here to baptize your family. <laughs> we, we can't leave the jail yet till you become a part of the Christian. And they told that man how to be saved. He took them home. He, they baptized him. Then they left. The house was shaken because they were on mission. Jesus said, if you don't change, if you don't move to a place of strength, if you don't take serious your spiritual complacency and do something about it, I will spew you out of my mouth. Right. You ever drink lukewarm stuff? You know, uh, put icing in it, ice, ice cubes in it, you set it on the counter, you get busy, you, you, forgo, you forget to go back. Mm. I've, I've got me a big jar of juice mm -hmm. that I put ice in it and everything. I put it in my car and I got to talking. And I had to, I had to confess I, I talked too much. And so I didn't go back to it all day. I went back to it today. It's been sitting there for two days. I'm ready now this morning on the way to church to have me a cool drink to prepare me for the word of God. I sipped it and had to spit it out. It wasn't cold. It wasn't hot. It didn't taste good. I just ready to pour it out because it was, it was not... It had gotten to a place, it was good for nothing. That's right. Oh, my family, don't get to a place where you are now good for nothing. That God cannot use you like he wants because you don't need him anymore. Oh, notice the, what Jesus says. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you now can be rich. Right. Ellen White says this gold fire in the fire is faith that's been put to the test and has been refined. You ever be in a place where you told somebody something you'd never do mm. or a situation you thought you'd never have to deal with mm. and then when it happened to you that very thing you thought you'd never have to deal, it challenged your faith. Sometimes the Lord allows us to fall into situations so we can recognize our faith is not as deep as we thought it was. Sometimes we have faith in people and then people fail us. That's on purpose because God is trying to move your security from folk. God is trying to move your security from positions. God is trying to move your security from finances. God wants you to be able to build your security on one thing, Jesus Christ and his promises because everything else is going to pass away. Oh, I'm glad for long for you. I, I, the saints have blessed my soul for years, but one day this should not just be closed down for the pandemic. One day this church will be closed down for good. Right. I'm glad for the spiritual people who have mentored me and people I've loved for a while. But the day will come, they'll be dead and buried. Right. And if I have not had an experience where I, where I now have my own faith, mm. I'm going to make it. Buy of me gold. Buy? Mm -hmm. Buy? I thought grace was free. It is, but it's on the exchange table. <laughs> <All right. laughs> you want my grace? <laughs> Give me your heart. <laughs> That's right. You want my grace? <laughs> Give me your life. Right. Give me your stuff, and I'll give you my stuff. Right. Give me all your burdens and all your struggles and all your attempts, and you take, you give that to me, and I'll give you a hope. I'll give you a purpose. I'll give you a power. I'll give you a vision. I'll, I will give you stuff that you never thought you could get. I, I've got it on hold with your name on it, but I can't give it to you because you, you, you're so full of you. If God can't be God of all, he won't be God at all. He will not be your second, <laughs> your second to be right. He, he won't be your your go-to backup man if you tried everything else. He's not your last resort. 
He needs to be your first call. Buy of me gold, faith, tried in the fire. Then you'll be rich. White garments that your nakedness may be revealed. This garment in the test of New Testament, as you study it, reflects the righteousness of Christ. I like the way God does this stuff. When I come to Jesus, all messed up, I say, Lord, I can't save me. I'm a mess. Forgive me, take me. The Bible says he takes me and then he credits me with his life. Oh, that's, that's, that's like, it's like you ain't got no money in the bank and I, 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 I deposit a million dollars in your bank account. Your bank account jumps up. You rich. Uh, how did you get that money? Well, he just gave it to me. Now your status changed. You're the same old person, but now your status has changed because you're rich. Grace comes, and God covers me with his righteousness, and I love it. He covers me while I'm still messed up. I get credit for a life I haven't lived yet. I'm still messing up. I'm still failing. I'm still falling apart. But God has graced me and said, look, I'll cover you so on the books you're perfect, and the Holy Spirit comes under you. And starts working on you, changing you, fixing you. So that one day, when the Lord pulls the covers off, the thing he told others that you are, because of his power, you had to come. Oh, you know, you you see somebody's born, and and you look at that little child, and you say, I don't know who child you is, but you look like a Horton. Are you a Horton? <laughs> I was, when my kids were small, I went to MJA to uh, pick up my child. A little short white girl came. She looked at me. Hmm. You look like Paul Jones. Are you Paul Jones's daddy? Uh-huh. <laughs> I had never seen this child before. She didn't know me at all, but she knew my son. And she could see, uh, my son has a gap in his teeth, and this man has a gap in his teeth. Uh, My son is light-skinned, and he's light-skinned. My son is about bald, he's about, yeah. I'm his father, how'd you know? Because the look like Jesus one day is going to pull the covers. And they're going to say, are you you little Jesus? A little shorter than he is. (laughs) You may have a few more pounds than he is, but it looks like you've been been shaped again. You you reflect and look like the God that saved you. Then finally, not only do you need a garment, not only do you need faith, but then he says you need eye salve (laughs) that you might see. I just had cataracts about a month ago, and they got me on drops in my eyes to heal my eyes. It protects me from infection and eye swelling. And I take three drops a day. I'm still taking drops. When I don't take my eyes drops, things get foggy. When I don't take my eye drops, I had headaches. Uh, The doctor told me, are you, are you taking your eyes drops? Mm. And I had to confess, I was not as faithful. I kind of missed some loops. I, some days I was too busy. Mm. But in doing so, I paid the price. I, I, t- I took my eye drops today so I could see. Yeah. Yeah. Here, this eye salve is the Holy Spirit. Yes. He says, you need eye salve so that you are able to see. That's right. Oh, <laughs> can I mess with you? God doesn't give you the Holy Spirit to make you an FBI detective of everybody else in Longview. God doesn't give you the Holy Spirit so you can look at what's wrong with everybody else. God gives you the Holy Spirit that you can see yourself, see your need, be close to God and the Holy Spirit who comes when he comes. Everything else you need comes when he comes. 
reason we don't have the Spirit like we could have the Spirit. We don't feel the need of the Spirit. And God is working on us, reconfigurating our whole circumstance so that he can get us to a place where we can see our need. As I close, there's a picture. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. This thing shook me up. The church with all the truth comes to the end of time. Feels it doesn't need God. Thinks it's okay. And the God of the church says you're wretched, blind, spiritually naked. You need help. And here's Jesus standing on the outside, knocking the door, trying to get in. This picture is a picture of our individual hearts. Is, is God trying to get your attention still? Haven't you gone through enough? Suffered enough? Lost enough? Been hurt enough? Failed enough? Stumbled enough? That you're convinced now that you don't have the solution? And that you need to turn to God. Jesus says, I'm standing at the door and knocking. Let me in. Because of, he's a God who wants permission. He could kick the door down, but he's not that kind of God. If we don't allow him to come, if we don't open up for him to come, he'll be on the outside. I hate when Christ comes, I was lost because though I was in the church, I was never in Jesus. Though I've been in Longview for 25 years, God doesn't dwell in my heart. Though I know all the texts about the Sabbath and the state of the dead and all these other things, but really, I don't run my life like God is real. I don't know about you, but in these dark times, in these last times, more and more I recognize how much I need God. I've been preaching for 54 years, but I still need God. I've watched God do miracles in my presence, but I, yesterday's blessing ain't what I need. I need a fresh encounter with God Every day. I need church to mean something. I need to be about something. Because I'm watching a world coming to a climax. And soon, the Lord's going to say, it's done. You might be here today, and you've heard the door knock, Lord knocking on your life, saying, I need to move in. I need to take over. I need a deeper conversation. We need to talk. We need to make an exchange. There's still some stuff you're holding on to that you need to let go of. And I recognize you can't let go of it because you don't have the strength. But if you let me in, I'll take care of it. If you need the Lord to take care of some things for you, I want you to stand. Some of you have been given Bible studies and you've been coming to this church and you've been impressed by these people, this preacher, and you're trying to make up your mind to join the church and be baptized. If you're here today, while I'm here, I've been authorized by heaven to invite you now today to come forward and give God your hand. I say, Lord, I know I'm a mess. But I'm your mess. 
I know I've got problems, but you've got solutions. I know I'm weak, but you promised I can be strong. Take God up on his word. There is nothing he will not do to save you. It's your time. God can do it for you. in your life that have been models but you have to make a decision nobody else is going to say you're not too young to decide you're not too old to decide you're not too broken to decide God can fix it he can cleanse you he can change you and he promises he can keep you I can testify to that I want to look back to see where I started from and where God has brought me. He's more than a good God. He's an awesome God. And if you think you had a life before you met him, you would not live yet until you have him. A wonderful for you, loving Lord. We stand here this morning, Lord, as you knock on our hearts. We're thankful for how far you brought us. But Lord, we recognize you're not where you need to be in us yet. There's still stuff we're holding on to, things we're waiting on, dreams we won't let go of, people and situations that we are stuck with. But God, we can't make it to the kingdom like this. And you've been patient and merciful. And you just keep on knocking and keep on knocking. You said, let me all the way in. I'm tired of being your part-time lover. Let me all the way in. Let me be not just your savior, but let me be your Lord. Not Lord of your church life, but Lord of your whole life. God, forgive us for taking for granted our, our condition, thinking we are better than we are, thinking we're safe, thinking that we can just step off of this land and step into the kingdom like we are. We can't be there until we're just like you. So Lord, visit every brother of mine, every sister of mine who stands in earnest and do for me, do for us what needs to be done in the time that's left. And then, Lord, thank you for my new church family members who've joined. Continue to grow them as we protect them. For that man, that woman, that boy, that girl who felt a little nudge today, who still was afraid to come. Keep pushing, Lord. Keep knocking. And then they say, I surrender. I thank you for all you are and all you do. In Jesus' name, let us people say, Amen.
Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to say thank you, Jesus. It's change in my life. He will change anyone because he changes me. Praise God for the word.